In this video, I'm going to be upgrading this 13-inch mid-2012 Apple MacBook Pro from its stock 2.5 GHz dual-core Intel Core i5 CPU to this quad-core Intel Core i7 CPU. Now, for those of you who have researched this upgrade in the past, you would know that uh, most people would say that upgrading a dual-core Ivy Bridge BGA CPU to a quad-core one is actually not possible. Now, in most cases, that is actually correct, uh, but Intel released a very unique chipset, which I've got right here, that will actually, in theory, allow me to upgrade a dual-core M-series um, BGA Intel Core CPU, Ivy Bridge, of course, to a quad-core Ivy Bridge CPU. And that is the QE series Intel Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge CPUs. And what makes these unique is that unlike the QM series quad core CPUs, the QE series shares the same BGA footprint and pinout as the dual core M series Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge CPUs. So if we go ahead and flip it over here, we can take a look at that. Um, and you can see that the BGA footprint looks like this. Now I've also got over here a QM series, so a standard quad-core um, Intel Core i7 CPU. And you can see that this one is a Sandy Bridge one, so the die is quite a bit larger, uh, but the pinout and BGA footprint and all is identical between Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge. So if I go ahead and flip that chip over as well, you can immediately see that there is a pretty big difference in the way the uh, BGA balls are laid out on the bottom of the chip. So of course, installing a QM series chip like this onto a board meant for a QE series, or of course the standard dual core M series CPU, wouldn't be possible. Now, this upgrade is not something that I think has ever been done before. Um, so I have no idea if the system firmware supports a QE series chip or if the board itself even supports a QE series. Um, but if it is a firmware issue, I can, of course, uh, create a core boot port for this machine, just like I did for that custom 2011 17-inch mid-2012 spec upgraded machine I made a video about previously. So the first thing I want to do here uh, before I get started with the upgrade is I want to run a Geekbench on the machine just to see, uh, get a baseline performance test that we can compare against the system after we have upgraded its CPU. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and open up Geekbench here. Uh, I'll go ahead and select later on this. And once this loads up here, you can see we've got the Intel Core i5-3210M CPU installed. Of course, that is the base model CPU configuration on the mid-2012 13-inch uh, unibody MacBook Pro. And you can see here, I've also got 16 gigabytes of system memory installed. So with that, we'll go ahead and run the CPU benchmark and I'll resume the video and show you the results once the benchmark has completed. All right, so as you can see here, the benchmark has completed successfully and we have received a single core score of 566 and a multi-core score of 1060. Now, as you can see here, of course, we are running still with the stock specs. You can see the 3210M there, um, and there are the rest of the scores if you care to look at them. Um, now, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that right now, um, but of course, we will do a deeper comparison once the results are in with the newly installed CPU. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get the machine disassembled, uh, get the board taken out. And once I get the board out, I want to do a comparison between this chip. Uh, this is a 3615QE, by the way, if I forgot to mention that. Um, and I want to compare it with the uh, CPU that's currently on this board, the 3210M. So I'm going to go ahead and get the board out, and we'll take a look at the CPUs. All right, so as you can see here, I have gotten the board uh, out of the chassis and disassembled here. Um, and you can clearly see there is a pretty big difference between the original um, 3210M CPU right here and our target uh, 3615QE CPU right here. I'll go ahead and place that one even closer. Just place it on top of the PCH. And yeah, you can obviously see that the die on the quad-core one 
is just about twice the length of the original uh, dual core die, so that I guess checks out pretty well. Um, and if we also take a look at the heat sink, uh, you can see that that uh, definitely will have plenty of room for that quad core die, um, so there's really nothing to worry about there either. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get this board on my board preheater, and we will prepare it um, to remove the original 3210M um, in preparation to install our new 3615QE. So with that, I'll go ahead and get this on the board preheater, and we'll go from there. All right, so as you can see here, I've gotten the board up on the board preheater. Um, so the first step, as always, is to remove the edge bonding on all four corners of the original chip. And once that's hot, that simply pulls off, just like so. And now that that's done, of course, the next step we need to do is just apply some fresh flux to the perimeter of the chip. And now that the flux has been applied, I'm just going to go ahead and align the hot air nozzle. And then we can desolder the chip. Alright, so the chip is now ready to come off, so I'm just going to remove it using my vacuum chip puller here. And now that the chip has been removed, all we need to do now is remove all the residual solder using my soldering iron and some solder wick. So first I'm just going to start by applying some fresh solder and removing all of the big chunks of solder. And now that most of the solder has been removed, we'll just remove all the rest of it using the solder wick. And now that all the residual solder has been removed, we just need to clean the old flux using some rubbing alcohol and a paper towel. Alright, and as you can see there, all the residual flux has now been cleaned. So the next thing we need to do is get the new chip prepared with some flux uh, before we solder it onto this board. So I'm going to go ahead and get that new chip uh, ready to go here, and then we'll align it and solder it onto the board. Alright, so in order to uh, prepare this chip to solder on the board, we just need to apply some flux to it. just like so. And then with that done, we're just going to take a pair of tweezers, hold the chip, and allow the flux to flow on all of the solder balls. Now one thing I should mention, and it should be pretty obvious at this point, is that this chip actually came with solder balls pre-applied. Uh, which is usually the case uh, with BGA chips when you buy them. Um, and the only reason you would really need to reball a chip is if you pulled it off another board and needed to prepare it to install onto a different board. So anyway, with that flux applied, we just need to take a paper towel and wipe away all of the excess flux. As you can see, uh, there is uh, way too much on there and that will actually cause issues uh, when soldering the chip. So I'm just going to get the chip like this and simply wipe away all of that excess flux. So now we're just left with a relatively thin layer of flux, uh, which is exactly what we want. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and go back over to the board preheater, and then we'll begin the process of aligning and soldering this new chip on. 
All right, so now that we've gotten the new chip prepared, of course, the first thing we need to do is we need to apply some fresh flux to the board itself, just a very small amount. And just like with the chip, I'm gonna use a paper towel to wipe away uh, most of the excess flux so we don't have too much on there. All right, so now with that done, we're gonna take our new chip and of course align it with pin one in the correct spot. So that would be up here. Just like so. And then the most difficult part of this whole process is aligning the new chip on because the board itself uh, doesn't actually have any silk screen on it. So we kind of have to eyeball it and guess a little bit. Uh, but I, luckily there's components pretty close to this chip so it shouldn't be too difficult. All right, that already looks good on the uh, vertical alignment there. So now I just gotta get the horizontal part of it aligned. All right, and that actually already looks pretty good. Um, I did also take a picture of it before I removed the original chip, uh, just so I could verify alignment for certain. So I'm gonna take a look at that, uh, do some final alignment adjustments, and then we'll begin the process of soldering the chip onto the board. All right, so after some careful checking of the alignment, everything looks good. Um, and just so you know, it doesn't have to be like 100% perfect. Uh, there is some room for error, especially with these chips because uh, the solder balls are considerably larger than some other chips are. Uh, but with that all done, uh, now we'll just align the hot air back over top of the chip, heat it once again to solder it onto the board. Okay, and that looks good. And based on what I saw on the chip, it looks like there are already leaded solder balls already on it. Um, so it actually should solder on pretty quickly. Um, if they are lead free, it'll take a little bit longer, uh, but we'll just go ahead and get started. All right, so they definitely are lead free, or definitely are leaded rather, um, and they're already actually soldered, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn the hot air off, and we'll just let the board cool down. All right, so as you can see here, the board has finished cooling down and the chip has been soldered on. Now, it didn't solder down exactly as perfectly as I had hoped. And the reason for that, I don't know if you can really make it out, but it is slightly raised on this top edge uh, when compared with the bottom edge here. And the reason for that is simply due to those capacitors that sit underneath the chip. So if we look at the original, uh, you can see that these capacitors sit there. And when I reball these chips, I usually use slightly larger solder balls. So that way um, these caps are a little farther recessed in comparison with these solder balls. Uh, but of course, whoever reballed this chip, uh, where I got it from China, um, did not use larger balls. So it may or may not work as it is. Um, if it doesn't work, I'm gonna go ahead and just have to take the chip back off, uh, reball it myself with some larger solder balls, and then solder it back on again. Uh, but hopefully, everything is soldered properly and the machine just boots and works. That would be ideal, of course. So I'm gonna go ahead and get some thermal paste applied, install the CPU heatsink, and we will give it the first power on test. Alrighty, so as you can see here, I've now gotten the board back reinstalled into the machine. Uh, I just partially reinstalled it, of course, because I am going to uh, ultrasonic clean it after I'm done here. Uh, but here's the moment of truth. Let's plug it in and see if it works. Oh, well, that's a good sign. Oh, yes. It actually works with the stock firmware. I don't even have to do any sort of custom firmware with core boot or anything. This is awesome. So I'm holding down the option key. Let's see, I must have done it too late. Let's try it again here. There we go. And there's the option menu. So let's go ahead and boot into Catalina once again and see if everything works. All right, 
right, so everything looks good so far. Let's head into about this Mac. And there it is, check that out. 2.3 gigahertz quad core Intel Core i7. Now that is an awesome sight to see on a mid 2012 13 inch MacBook Pro. So that is quite awesome. Let's go ahead into system report and check out everything here. So yeah, it detects all six megabytes of L3 cache. Total number of cores four. And I know this is a 2.3 gigahertz CPU. Um, However, the uh, CPU that was in here was 2.5 gigahertz. Now, that is actually sort of a misconception as the turbo boost frequency of this CPU goes up to 3.3 gigahertz, whereas the original CPU only went up to 3.1, I believe, or maybe 3.0, I can't remember exactly. Uh, but even though the base clock speed is a little bit lower, uh, this is still a faster CPU, both due to the quad core nature of it and the turbo boost clock frequency. So we'll go ahead and exit that and once again open up Geekbench. So there it is, you can see it detects it. The Core i7-3615QE at 2.3 gigahertz. Of course we've got that same 16 gigs of memory installed. So let's go ahead and run the benchmark. Alright, so as you can see here, the Geekbench has completed successfully, and boy are those results awesome. Check that out. A single core score of 713, and a multi-core score of 2739. And compared to the original scores with the original CPU, that is a massive, massive improvement. Wow, that's awesome. So let's scroll down here, take a look at the specs. So as you can see, everything is pretty much the same, except of course, that CPU. We now have the 3615QE compared to the 30, 3210M right there. And the only difference other than the core count, of course, is the L3 cache, of which we have six megabytes on the QE and three megabytes on the M. Um, so everything else should be pretty much the same here. Of course, the scores won't be. So yeah, there's our new score over here and our original score over here. So yeah, that is really sweet there. Let's go down here. So yeah, that that is the massive difference, the uh, multi-core score, of course, as you'd expect, because we doubled the core count. And just to verify all that's working, if the scores wasn't enough, we can go into uh, um, uh, activity monitor here and we can go to CPU usage and yeah, as you can see all four cores, well technically eight cores with the hyper threading enabled are detected and working as intended. So that is a very awesome and very successful upgrade of this mid 2012 13 inch MacBook Pro from a dual core Intel Core i5 CPU to a quad core Intel Core i7 CPU. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this video.